Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Maureen. Um, I am from Adiantum and Ontier, and I've been skating for almost two years now, but I've been creating and teaching about wild inks for close to seven now. So my two worlds have combined and I get to just enjoy both sides of it and really lean more into the history side of things too. I've been learning so much the last couple of years and continue to. I hope that never ends. <laughs> um, my persona is from the British Isles from Ireland, um, which correlates well to where we're living now in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of the flora and fauna is very similar. So it's been fun to um, just explore those. And I like teaching this um, just to give people encouragement to go out and explore the places that they are and find the colors that are all around them to play with. Um, we have these awesome manuscripts and uh, paintings, murals on walls that have survived. But I just like to imagine people back there were experimenting with these colors too and trying to figure out what did work and what would last. And um, when now we found out some that haven't so well, but they're still really fun to play with, especially um, painting <laughs> in the day to day. Sorry, got a puppy. All right, so um, usually when I teach this class, I like to take everybody outside for a foraging hike or walk and we go and collect what's around us. Um, Obviously, we're not going to do that today, uh, but I'll, I'll almost be covering the techniques that we use to what to look for when we're out hiking um, and how to turn them into a usable paint or ink, as well as um, mention some of the, the plants that were used, that we know for sure were used in uh, manuscripts. I'm sorry, I said plants. I meant materials because I'm going to cover a lot more than plants. All right. I have two handouts. Um, if our regular... Uh, mo uh, moderator comes in. He said he was going to post some of the comments. If not, I'll do that at the very end. We'll figure that out too. But one of them is some of the basic recipes that I'm going to go over in class today. And the other one is a lot of resources and links to more resources. So you'll have plenty more study to do should you so desire. All right. So to begin, I'd like to start with basic foraging etiquette. Um, First of all, is make sure you have permission to gather from wherever you want to gather from. Um, if you're gathering weeds like I like to do, most people are more than happy to have you come and pull their weeds for them <laughs> or pick up a couple rocks. It doesn't take a lot to make most of these paints. So usually it's not a problem, but you just good to ask first. Um, and then you want to make sure that the things you're wanting to forage aren't endangered or um, threatened in any way. There's some here. Um, trillium flowers take seven years to grow from seed to flower. So I they're around, but I like to leave them be because they have such a long turnover rate. <laughs> and then things like lichen that take so long to grow. Um, often they'll, they'll fall down on their own in windstorms and there's plenty to gather there, but just things like that to keep in mind and to research. Doing, making paints out of these wild materials is a good way to learn about them. Like I like herbalism too, but I'm not super confident on all my identification. So it's a good way to like start identifying things without consuming it. Um, and then finally only take what you need. I generally only take a few leaves, a few petals, especially if I'm just trying something out for the first time. It doesn't take a lot. And then I always leave um, at least a third of any given population behind so that you can return and gather more in the future. All right, so I am going to just go through different types of materials. Um, I have six different categories that we're gonna go through, um, how you might encounter them and how you might use them in your art. And I hope, um, yeah, I hope to encourage you just to experiment with, with what you have around you. All right, so first I'm gonna go over rocks and minerals. I'm gonna start here because we see it a lot in um, medieval color that's um, that survived because it, it's very long lasting. It's not going to fade. It's not, um, it has great color fastness. Um, and one we hear about a lot is ochre. And I've got an ochre stone here. Can everybody see in here? Okay. Is that, we're doing all right. Okay. Um, so ochre stones are found in clay beds. They're soft silicate stones. Um, usually they come in nature. They're more like the yellows and, and oranges. We were talking about this before we started recording, but you'll see sometimes some ochres that are high in iron, you can basically roast and they'll turn a vivid, beautiful red color. Um, that's not always the case, depending on the ochre where you're from. Um, ochres also make up, um, like they're named based on where they come from. 
So you'll see like raw sienna and burnt sienna, raw umber, burnt umber. Those are from those are from place names and if they're roasted or not, basically. Um, so I'm going to call this one curtain because this is where I found it. All right. So let's see. Found in man manuscripts as well as murals. I have um, an example of this here. So I want to just test it out and see how it worked. And so I painted a shield for my husband. Ooh, it's upside down. My hope was to it, for it to last one event because, you know, I was just playing with it. I just wanted to see what would happen. Um, and it's survived over a year now. And the shield, the wood broke before the paint came off. So I'm really happy with the strength of it um, and just the variety I was able to get with it. This is also contains bone black, which we'll talk about later, but there's a, a little bit different two tones in the gold ochre. And this is um, with the egg to make it slightly gold or slightly darker. And then the highlights are without, they're just mixed with water and that's what keeps it a little bit brighter. But we'll get into that in just a second. All right, so the process for taking ochres or any stones Obviously there are a lot of stones that you can use too. I'm just using ochres as my example because they're really soft and they're easy to work with. But um, I've used pumice, we've got green earth, uh, terra vert, as we've talked about in other classes too, I have this morning. I don't know if you can see it. This one I believe is from France, but there's also this local stone. We can get it out here. And I don't know the name of it. I've asked several rocking people. I found this up in the Cascades. They were cutting a new road in. And the entire hillside was this green rock and it, it's working great. It's uh, It's been a beautiful paint. Okay, so there's pumice, there's ochres, there's the green earth. Let's see. Well, then the, the harder ones like lapis lazuli, that's a much harder stone to work with. So not only was it rare, it had to be imported from Afghanistan. Um, it's very hard to work with, it took a lot of crushing. Okay, so basic process for rocks um, is, is a mulling process. And there's a bit more safety you want to use with this one, partially because um, especially unknown rocks, they could contain unknowns in them, like uh, lead, arsenic, and breathing the dust can cause silicosis. So we just want to be safe, wear goggles, wear, wear a mask. I'm going to move my tea out of the way so I can show you things. <laughs> All right, so for mulling, you can get real mullers online which are usually glass. This is a tempered glass cutting board that I got online. And I use an um, electric insulator. It just has to have a really flat top. Well, some of them have like the engraved or embossed um, numbers on them. But if you can find it with a flat top, it's been working great for me so far. So you're gonna take your ochre. Sometimes I'll have to hammer off a small piece, but I'll take a small piece of the ochre and then I put it in a mortar and pestle. My blacksmith husband made this one for me out of iron. And it works amazing because it's got a like, great tooth to it. And you grind it as fine as you can in there. And then from that point, you'll brush it on to your mulling board. And from here, you can add your binder. Um, binders can be um, gum arabic. They can be the egg white. I've seen people use egg yolk. I know um, a lot of the local Native American groups have been known to use fish eggs because the same thing, it's got the albumin, albumin in it that holds it all together and gives it some strength. Um, let's see what else. Oh, honey, you could use. Uh, I'm kind of starting to experiment with some local saps too, rather than the gum arabic. There's been several that have been really interesting and like have a similar consistency. So another point of future experiments. Anyway, and then you take the, the rock, ground rock, the dust, and the binder, and you're gonna mull it. Little circles starting in the middle, slowly moving out um, until you get the consistency you want. And if it gets too far out, I have this little scraper that I use to push all back in the middle, do the whole process again until it's the consistency you want it to be. And that, excuse me, as long as you don't use the egg yolk, they all recon reconstitute very well, just adding water to it. I'll put them in little shells these are little muscle, muscle shells from the beach. <laughs> and uh, they're really easy to reconstitute again later. All right, any questions on rocks before I move on?
Next, we're going to do metals. Metals were used for more very, very enduring paint. I'm going to start with the verdigris, the copper, because it's so beautiful. <laughs> so a lot of times we'll talk about verdigris and um, vinegar. Oh, I'm going to see if I can hold something behind this so you can see the color. It's just such a beautiful. Can you see the color there? It's a, it's a bright green. It reminds me of like some kind of liqueur or something. But if you put the same copper in ammonia, a uh, um, high base, it could was probably stale urine in the past. Um, you can use ammonia, you can use hardwood, ash, lye, also very, um, very high on the pH scale. Anyway, you put in that and you get basically a cobalt blue solution. And it's so beautiful. It doesn't dry the Sprite, it dries lighter. But um, it's just such a shockingly beautiful, <laughs> vibrant color. It's really fun to play with. And then if you should dry it, it'll turn into this really nice green powder that's easy to reconstitute and use in your paintings as well. All right. Oh, and a, a different base, like for the green green. A different. If you didn't want to use um, vinegar, you could use um, and I say like lemon juice as well and then the one we've all heard of is the iron oak gall ink i have a chip of iron here from the blacksmith shop too so i'm saying i forged on the back <laughs> the blacksmith's floor and what you do is you're going to take your iron and you're going to cover it with vinegar and let it soak for at least three weeks and you get kind of a tea colored solution and then you take your oak galls which we'll talk about a little bit more later these are on, there's a lot of variety of these depending on where you live, but they grow from oak wasps on the on the leaves, and they're really easy to collect in the fall. Anyway, take I take like a handful of that maybe, cover it in water, let it simmer for about 20 minutes, and it'll make another tea looking sort of solution. But when you pour the two of those together, I like to do it in equal proportions. Uh, it makes a beautiful dark black. It can be brown if you lighten it up a bit, but this is a great one for, for inks, for calligraphy, but I use it for many, many other pieces of art as well. All right. If you don't have easy pickings at a blacksmith shop, you can use um, um, other iron. You can use uh, steel. Steel wool works great because it has so much surface area and it'll be the iron that dissolves out of that. Um, but just never use anything galvanized. It can create really harmful fumes. So just stay away from that and you should be good. All right, so just some other metals before we move on. Let's see here. We've got, I've just been come <laughs> aware of silver point because it, it's new to me. Um, it's basically a silver wire in a pen. This is just a graph, so you could use anything really. Um, but if you, uh, Prime your paper with uh, and any other paint with a little bit of tooth to it. You can draw on it, and it looks like it looks like light pencil drawing, but it's very enduring. It's not going to fade. Da Vinci used it a lot for his sketches uh, of his contraptions, um, and you can use other metals too. You can use, uh, I guess, more wealthy people would use gold, gold wire, so gold point. Um, Anyway, I just thought that was fascinating rather than it's not really an ink or paint, but <laughs> using the metal too. And then of course you have the gold and silver leaf. I've seen it used both as leaf or ground for illumination as well. All right, any questions on metals? I see something in the chat. Are we doing okay? Oh. Just they thought your missing rock was azurite. Okay, I'll have to look into that. I would love to figure out what it actually is. I'm not a rock person, so I'm always asking people. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Put that down here. Okay. Well, let's move on to lichen and fungi. Um, lichen are very. There's a lot of lichen. A lot of lichen here. Uh, I just picked up this branch this morning to show you one of the down branches from the last windstorm we had. And there's at least five different kinds of lichen on this little branch, but most of them won't really do anything. There's a type of lichen that contains orchil, which is a chemical compound um, when used in a high 
pH solution um, will yield very vibrant pinks and purples. And this has been used as a dye in Scotland for, oh goodness, over a thousand years. It, uh, the purples have been found in the Book of Kells and Lindisfarne Gospels. Um, and there's a way you can find them when you're out walking. A lot of people take with a little tiny spray bottle of bleach. And when you spray the lichen, it'll flash red if it contains this orchil compound. And so that's a way you can search it out while you're out, out and about. And then you take it home. Uh, it does take a bit and it's kind of finicky. <laughs> I've been trying to get this one to work for me for about four years now. And I finally have this tiny little vial. Let's see, did I bring it up here? Little tiny vial and it's, you, I'm gonna try to put the paper up again so you can see the flash of color. It's finally starting to get that reddish, it's all kind of mauvey. It's still not as bright as I know they make in Scotland. In Scotland, they have a different lichen. It's called a cud bear that they use. Uh, so different lichen. So it might just produce different results, but it's finally becoming more than just beige. <laughs> so I'm calling it a success. All right. So once you have it, you bring it home and there's a fermentation type process, um, again, using the ammonia, but theoretically anything with a high pH, strong base would work. So you take it and you cover it in ammonia and you have to leave it there for at least three months. And every day you're going to shake it and you're going to open it to let it breathe. Um, so it's a long process. It's a, it's, it's one you have to <laughs> keep on top of, but uh, eventually you can get some, some really unique colors out of it. All right. And then fungi. So I don't have a lot of resources for fungi being used in, um, medieval manuscripts, but they're really fun to play with and you can get some neat colors. Um, the first one I like to show is ink cap because it's literally caught as ink in its name. If you see ink cap fungi, they're, they have kind of a gray head, but then they look like they're just dripping and oozing black ink and they're beautiful. And their entire life cycle of the fruiting body is only 24 hours. So you pick them when you can find them. I like to put mine on a little plate a bit dusty now but um they dry out but again really easily reconstituted just a little bit of water you mix it up and it makes a beautiful like dark charcoal gray you could also save the spores from different mushrooms and again it's already powdered you just reconstitute it and it's ready to go there's also some that work well fresh like uh field caps or um sulfur tufts they're yellow i just crush them up maybe add a little water if it needs it ready to go and same with the Cordinarius. Uh oh, this guy fell apart. It's in rough shape. <laughs> but you can get um, really vibrant reds and oranges from these using the same method. All right. And then I don't have them right now because they're out of season. They just stopped a couple weeks ago. But um, if you have lobsters or scaly cap chanterelles, they're the bright, vivid orange mushrooms, right? Um, and you simmer them down, they'll turn brown. But then you add in a little bit of ammonia any, or any other strong base, and it'll turn a beautiful mauvey lavender sort of color. So you get another fun chemical reaction with those. All right. Any questions on lichen or fungi? All right. I'm going to move on to animal, which can be a little ethical dilemma for some people. So here's fair warning. We're going to go into this. Um, the one a lot of people think of with uh, medieval art is um, Kermes, which was an oak parasite and is similar to the cochineal that was used later and now. Um, they're little aphid-like creatures. Um, cochineal is uh, parasitic to prickly pear cacti. And I haven't been able to find any yet. I planted a bunch of prickly pear in hopes that it would become infested, but no such luck. <laughs> Maybe someday, but I, I did have a friend that got some at a run fair up here and she let me try it a little bit. They're a beautiful magenta color when they're first fresh and then after they're dried and reconstituted, it's um, reddish orange color. If you can see that that column there, that's the color it is when it's all done. That's my little tester notebook. I always test out my colors. And, um, <clears throat> so anyway, tiny little bugs, aphid-like, they turn red when you crush them. And they, and they stay red, it's a, it's a good ink. Um, because it's related to aphids, another one of my want to experiment further 
uh, avenues is other aphids. Mine on the, the broccoli I have growing out here are just green. But I had a lady in town found some on um, stinging nettles. And when she crushed them, they turned red. So now I'm super curious if any other aphid type creatures would produce the same thing. So maybe something to test where you live too. All right. And then we have bone black, which is one of the best blacks I've ever used. Um, I know this was mentioned in the class earlier too, but you're dressing to take bones. We had sheep, so we had some sheep bones left over from a, um, a butcher. And you have to completely enclose them so no air can get in. And you stick them in the coals or fire and you let them burn. Ours took a couple hours and they still weren't all the way done. So it can take a long time. And then you get this like just perfectly black color and you grind it, you mull it the same way you would do the stones. Um, very similar to that is uh, this lamp black. So this is from our lanterns. This is kind of nice because it's already powdered. You can kind of save yourself a step there. But again, just really deep black. And you can mold that up with any of the binders we talked about earlier as well. And then alternately you have bone white. The seasons aren't fully fully burned yet, but I like to save bones. Especially, I know bird, bird bones were used a lot because they're so small and easily crumbleable anyway. Um, so these are burned with oxygen, so they don't have to be covered or anything, and then they turn really nice and white. And opaque, too, because it's it's easy to get white, but it's, it's not as easy to get a good opaque white. All right. Let's see. Anything else under animals? Oh, shells. There's been some... Um, we live not too far from the ocean, about an hour, maybe. So every now and then, if I can find a bright shell, I try to see what color it'll make, too. And sometimes it can get... Decent colors. This was from a Dungeness crab. Um, and I know there's some mussels. Again, with these ones, you want to be really careful with the breathing thing because they can contain um, heavy metals. So you just got to be really careful and keep yourself safe when grinding things like that. <laughs> All right. Any questions about animals? This here. All right. Then we'll finish up with plants. I'm going to save this one for last because it is so diverse and it is so temperamental. <laughs> uh, there's often poor color fastness with these. And in my mind, that's fine. Like, I just have fun playing with the colors. And more last longer than I expect them to. And I just think it's fun to play with. And it's fun to, um, you know, probably do some of the same experiments that people were doing in Middle Ages when they were trying to figure out what was working and what was not. And um, what I usually do is I mundanely will paint with them and then scan it in right away so I can preserve those colors in my art. And, um, but a lot of them, if I keep them out of the sunlight, I've had some that have lasted five years or more and they're still doing great. So in my mind, I'm, I'm fine with that. So take that as you will. Um, some, let's talk about some from medieval manuscripts first. Well, um, matter would give reds. We locally have a similar variety. I've always just called it sticky weed, ladies bed fern. It goes by many names. But you'll see this, it has little little sticky spheres with like little, um, not quite thorns on them, but they stick to everything. Um, and it's similar enough in the family that you can use it in place of matter. So you maybe have something where you are that would also do have the same result. But the thing is it takes their roots. They've got these tiny little thread like roots and so you got to take lots of roots to get much color. And you just simmer them down another at least 20 minutes. Some of them take longer. You just want to make sure you're not boiling them. And you'll get a, a red bath, which you can fur further um, boil down to get a more intense color. All right. Then there was Brazil wood, sap and wood, also reds. They were imported from India or in later Brazil. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, in the medieval times. And I have not found anything similar for that yet, but maybe where you are, you will find. Then we've got woad. Um, woad contains the indigo pigment. Um, so, so blues, it's actually invasive in Southern Oregon. I'm really hoping to find some this, um, this upcoming summer. And I, I believe it's invasive in many parts of the U S I could be wrong, but it's in the, in the mustard family. So it's going to look like a wild mustard. It's another one to kind of look out for. And then we've got buckthorn berries, which someone was mentioning earlier. Uh, they're going to give you a nice lasting yellows and greens. And our, our local variety is a deer bush. I haven't been able to find any berries on them yet. So 
still looking there. And then we talked about earlier the oak galls, which are these. But with that oak gall iron ink, I have found you can use just about any tree material because um, you're just looking for anything that's high in the tannins, right? That's what it causes the chemical reaction. So I've used pine cones, bark, nuts, roots. You can, um, if you can't find the oak galls, you probably have something around you that would that would do the trick. All right, so I just encourage you to experiment with what you do have available. Um, look for things that are naturally highly pigmented. The things that are white aren't gonna do a lot for you. Um, there's four main pigments we find in nature and a vast, vast majority of the things you're gonna find. We've got chlorophyll, right? We've got the greens. Um, greens do turn brown when they're crushed and exposed. The chlorophyll will turn brown when it's exposed to air. So I found the quicker you can make the dry time, like make small batches, use it quicker dry time, the more it'll keep its color. Um, let's see. We have a comment. Um, yes. Somebody's offering to get seeds for you if you can't find woad. Thank you. I might take you up on that <laughs> to find you afterwards. <laughs> I think I'm not supposed to plant them here because they are invasive, but maybe if I put it in a pot, we'll see. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So the green, the color can be improved with a binder like egg that kind of en encloses the, the pigment. Um, I, you know, got kids they come in with grass stains on their knees all the time and that color is is it hangs on it does pretty good so grass use clovers I like to use really fragrant things so I've got rosemary lemon balm I did a whole piece once only with fragrant cedar I just adjusted the color with some phs and it smelled amazing it was just divine so yeah feel free to play with you know what you have around you and what you enjoy I would just caution you against um leaves from plants that have like red or purple flowers or berries something about that pigment is throughout the plant. And so when you mix reds and greens, they kind of cancel each other out and they're more likely to just be brown. So something to look for. All right, then we have flavonoids, which are our yellows. Um, I like to crush these as minimally as possible. They also like to um, turn brown really quickly. Lots of yellows, lots of dandelions and daisies and buttercups are all good for that. Again, a good way to use up your weeds. <laughs> and then we have carotenoids, which are your oranges, carrot colors. Um, these ones are really fun because they deepen with ammonia base, any base. Uh, we have a crab apple tree out here. There's like one week in the fall where the leaves are just, just right. <laughs> and um, I can mix them with ammonia and they turn vibrant orange. I'll show you some of my art that I use it for. Like really just literally pumpkin orange. I don't know if you can see that. There's one, here's a fox I did. And um, and you can dry and reconstitute that one too. It really, I've been super impressed with that. All right, and then we've got lastly anthocyanins, which are anything from blue, blue to red, blue, red, purple. Um, they're very pH sensitive. Um, some of my favorites around here are wild iris and blackberries. Let's see if we can see the blues of this one. That was from a wild iris in the water there. Um, so since it is, I'm gonna show you my little magic trick with them because I have so much fun with the anthocyanins, even if they don't last very long. <laughs> All right, so right here, I don't have any flowers. I find like those burgundy roses uh, work the best. Obviously they're super highly pigmented. I don't have any of those right now. I had uh, some frozen elderberries <laughs> that I foraged this summer. So we're going to see how they do. It's not going to be as vibrant as a reaction because they have been frozen. They're not as pigmented.